So at uni, I've been writing an essay about the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and I found it really fascinating. So I thought, what if I make a video about the abolition of the slave trade in Yorkshire? So that's what I'm doing. Now, one of the things I find so fascinating about this topic is what I call the abolition paradox. You see, at the time, the slave trade was absolutely essential for the British industry and economy. I'm going to throw some stats out at you and I'll put the sources in the description. For example, a quarter of all ships in Liverpool were engaged directly in the trade. In 1793, 40% of Bristol's income came from the slave trade. Between 1791 and 1805, around 52% of all slave slaves traded in the Atlantic were on British ships and in 1805 55% of the world's sugar was produced in British colonies. So you can see then it wasn't just a minor trade, it was at the very heart of the nation's economy. So why would people who knew full well the consequences of banning such a trade, they didn't do this out of ignorance, why would they decide to pursue it. Well, it's one of the few times in world history when morals have triumphed over money in the first international human rights movement. Now, one thing I do have to mention, because I know at least one person will put it in the comments, is despite being debunked many times over in recent times, the economic decline theory still persists. It argues that actually the slave trade was becoming unprofitable by the early 19th century, and so the whole movement was motivated mostly by economics, and they used humanitarianism as a convenient justification to hide their real intentions. Now, as I've said, this has been debunked a lot, and I don't have the time to go into it today, but I will give a lot of good sources and books which show why it's wrong. Yorkshire was a bastion of abolitionism and I'm hoping that the facts I'm presenting will really showcase this. The movement utilised the power of petitions and the popular press. One example is in 1789, over 700 sheet metal workers in Sheffield signed a petition against the slave trade. Just four years later, that number had grown to over 8,000. That shows how quickly the movement gained momentum. One petition in Addingham called the movement avowedly repugnant to every moral and religious principle. It was truly a mass moral movement and not one limited to the wealthy and upper class. This one transcended class and gender lines. In addition, thousands of books, newspapers and pamphlets were printed to make it a truly mass media movement. Two of the most important pro-abolition newspapers in Yorkshire were the Leeds Mercury and the Sheffield Iris, which I'll talk more about later. One of the key ways this support was mobilised was through a lot of campaigners travelling around the country and giving talks. One of the most famous is Olauda Equiano, a former slave who visited many British towns and cities and wrote one of the most influential books of the abolition era, the interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano. He travelled across the country visiting Leeds, Sheffield, which he visited twice, York, Hull and many others. He would publish in 1791 this in the Leeds Mercury. Since then it does often fall to the lot of individuals to contribute to so important a moral and religious duty as that of putting an end to a practice which may, without exaggeration, be styled one of the greatest evils now existing on the earth, it may be hoped that each one will now use his utmost endeavours for that purpose. In 1790 the Sheffield Iris wrote this as an editorial after meeting Equiano. Hath not an African eyes, hands, organs and dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt by the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a European? Should any within the circle of our readers doubt the truth of this comparison, let them see Gustavus Vassa, the free African, now in Sheffield, his manners polished, his mind enlightened and in every respect on a par with Europeans. Another key travelling speaker was John Woolman. He was an American Quaker who travelled to Britain and he came to York where he died three weeks later. William Wilberforce too was a powerful travelling speaker. Now I'm not going to talk too much about Wilberforce for the simple reason that he is the most famous British abolitionist, but I'm just going to relay this one story which I find quite entertaining. In the 1806 election, one of the most serious topics of contention was slavery and he was doing the rounds to rally support even though the election was uncontested, but I'll get onto that later. He went to Halifax in West Yorkshire and such a great crowd greeted him that they swarmed to his carriage, uncoupled the horses and then physically pulled his carriage into town themselves. 
Now, if that doesn't say something about his popularity in Yorkshire, I don't know what will. Now, as I said, this 1806 election was uncontested, and I'm going to explain why. At the time, there were only two MPs for Yorkshire, and one of them was Henry Lascelles. He'd been elected in 1796. He was from the family which owned Harewood House, which had been built from the profits of a number of West Indian plantations. Now, he so recognised the popularity of abolitionism in Yorkshire that he decided not to run. He knew it would be a foolish endeavour, and so Wilbur Force and the second MP, Walter Fox from Geisley, both were elected because of their pro-abolition stance. We can see this abolitionist further, further, if we look at the 1807 election, which happened not that long after the passing of the Slave Trade Act. In that election, slavery was a huge part of the discourse and mudslinging, and there's one quite memorable event recorded in the Leeds Mercury where Lascelles was out campaigning in Leeds in the cloth halls, and he was greeted with shouts of, ow, ow, no Lascelles, no slavery, which clearly shows what was a prime concern for the people there. Needless to say, he was elected. And as an interesting bit of trivia, he was replaced by Charles Wentworth Fitzwilliam, who lived at Wentworth Woodhouse, the largest private house in the UK. I just thought I'd add that in because it's interesting. Now I just want to end with a really interesting story. It doesn't really have anything to do with my video, but it's interesting nonetheless. In 1758, there was a newspaper advert for a runaway slave called Thomas Anson who had escaped from Dent in Yorkshire. Now, historians didn't know what happened to him because we had no other records, but then someone discovered a record of him having been discharged from the 4th Dragoons in 1768. He'd served as a trumpeter and was discharged because he'd lost a tooth and could no longer play the trumpet. What's even more interesting is that two other runaway slaves had served in the same dragoons. Now, as I said, it's unrelated, but it's pretty interesting nonetheless. Now, I'd just like to end this video by saying that apart from that guy Wilberforce, Yorkshire doesn't really have that many big named people who are important in the movement. Rather, Yorkshire's importance comes from the great unknown, the ordinary people whose names haven't survived into the record of history but whose contributions nevertheless were essential for the success of the movement. It was those ordinary people who signed petitions, who boycotted West Indian rum and sugar, who campaigned and who put their own moral convictions over their and the nation's monetary gain. And to them we should all be eternally grateful for. So, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this video, I hope you've learnt something new and hope to see you again soon.